Wonderful. Hello and welcome to today's second session of the Carbon Friendly Forestry Conference. Today we'll be talking about extended rotations and how a new model might help us understand the potential carbon and harvest volume benefits. My name is Amrita Vatso, and I'm going to be your moderator today. First, we're going to start with a few logistical questions and notes. If you run into any issues during the session or have questions about the conference, please email the address that's pinned in the chat box to the right of the webinar screen. You can also use that chat box to send messages, but keep in mind that any messages you send will be visible to all attendees. If you'd like to submit questions to the speakers, then use the Q&A feature, uh, which you can access in the toolbar at the bottom of your webinar screen. We'll be sorting through these questions and presenting them to speakers at the, at the end of the presentation. Uh, and as a reminder, this session will be recorded and shared with all participants next week. All right, let's get started. So the exploration of strategies for greater forest carbon storage and sequestration has prompted discussion of extended rotations. Um, and we'll be talking today about what that means and what it implies. Extended rotations here means growing stands that are actively managed for timber for longer durations before they're harvested. And recent analysis has explored the potential challenges of shifting to extended rotations, including uh, a series by Sightline Institute. And for the forests of the west of the Cascades, extending rotations provides very significant carbon and biodiversity gains. However, there are questions um, about what this implies. And some stakeholders have raised questions about the impact of extended rotations on timber volume, on local employment, and on our local economies. Uh, we're also concerned about the possibility of displacing timber harvests elsewhere, a concept called leakage. And so in order to explore our transition to longer rotations, how they would impact carbon, harvest volume, net present value, and other economic considerations, Conservation Northwest and Washington Environmental Council has worked with Resilient Forestry to develop an optimization model. Um, and the results of, of that model will be what we explore to get today. Uh, spoiler alert, the model demonstrates that it is possible to achieve good outcomes for both carbon and local economies in the forest products industry, thus sequestering significant additional carbon while also increasing timber volume harvested and keeping local mills in business. Uh, these outcomes are enabled by an increased emphasis on thinning across the landscape. And so in our session today, panelists are going to describe this model, share their results, and discuss the po possible policy implications. So with that said, um, I'm gonna do some introductions next. Um, as you can tell, I am your moderator for the session. In my day job, I work at EFM Investments and Advisory, a company that has been implementing extended rotation forestry in the context of FSC certified forest management for almost 20 years. We manage 130,000 acres in the Western US within a commercial context. And so the challenge that we've laid out for ourselves is how to manage forests to increase carbon storage and sequestration, enhance biodiversity, protect fresh freshwater, all while supporting local economies while meeting or exceeding our timberland investment benchmarks. No small task. Uh, so we do know what it means uh, for landowners to extend rotations. We understand what that has um, in terms of an impact on our financial considerations. And our experience suggests that markets and private markets and governments have a role uh, to play in compensating landowners to embark on this long-term transition. Um, we, uh, as a landowner ourselves, have used uh, conservation easements, uh, NRCS funding, tax credits, and carbon offsets to bridge the economic gap that is caused by extended rotations. Um, and I'm happy to talk about our experience um, during Q&A. In 2003, along with our uh, partner organization and nonprofit Ecotrust, EFM developed an extended rotations carbon methodology. And under the VCS program, we've been using this methodology to generate high quality offsets purchased by Nike and General Motors. So it's that context and perspective that you know, I hope to, to share with you all and inform our conversation. Next, um, I am pleased to introduce you to the three of our presenters today. And I'm gonna request each panelist to turn on your camera as I, as I introduce you. Uh, presenters' bios are going to be in your conference materials and in the chat, so I'm gonna keep my introductions very short. First, we, 
to join us, Sean Geronimino is a principal economist at Resilient Forestry. Welcome, Sean. Paula Swedeen is the policy director at Conservation Northwest. Hi, Paula. And Rachel Baker is our forest program director at Washington Environmental Council. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, next, Paula and Rachel, I'm going to turn it over to you to provide context for our panel. Thanks so much. Um, I'll get us started off. We should have slides coming up soon, um, but I'll just begin explaining in the meantime. So it's, it's our job to give some brief framing for this project uh, and why we pursued it before we dive into the details. So the scientific literature tells us that extended timber rotations have significant carbon benefits. Um, we heard about this from Bill Keaton's presentation yesterday, um, particularly in Washington, where we have significant forest cover, high forest productivity, and an active forestry industry, uh, this potential is worth exploring. So in Washington, for some more state-specific context, our target of carbon neutrality by 2050 includes an assumption that 5% of emissions will be offset by biological sequestration. Um, last year at uh, the carbon conference, there was a presentation of a peer-reviewed study that looked at natural climate solutions potential across the state. Uh, the study looked at emissions reductions potential of 11 different natural climate solutions across agriculture, grassland, shrub steppe, forest sector, riparian areas, um, and it included a look at extended timber rotations. And what the study found was that among all natural climate solutions in Washington state, extending timber rotations from 45 to 75 years has the greatest potential for greenhouse gas reductions. It was responsible for 64% uh, of the total possible reductions. So clearly there's carbon benefits to be gained here, um, but we shouldn't be managing just for one value. We should look at other benefits beyond carbon. Um, so extended rotations can also provide other ecological benefits like uh, habitat for threatened and endangered species, water provisioning, wildfire risk mitigation. We heard about um, potential water uh, provisioning benefits of older forests yesterday and heard that 80 year old trees have many of the same hydrologic benefits as old growth. And there's potential economic benefits that we'll dive into later. So the central issue, as I describe it, is uh, ecological benefits of delaying harvest is greater than the short-term landowner costs, but transitioning from conventional practices is challenging. Uh, so to take a, a look at this, this problem uh, in Washington state, we decided to create a model that would help us understand what this transition could look like across the state um, and if and how we can do it without putting sawmills out of business, and without harming local economies. So I'll pass it to Paula for a little more context. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. So um, <clears throat> this issue is one that I have been thinking about and grappling with for, um, <clears throat> for at least 25 years as, as part of my career. I started thinking about it uh, as a wildlife biologist when I worked for um, Department of Natural Resources and uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife. And at that time, um, uh, DNR was was uh, in the early years of implementing its habitat conservation plan, and the idea of lengthening rotations to um, help restore habitat for species that need uh, larger trees and more complex structure um, really uh, just led to the idea that you know the only way that you do that in um, areas that are currently younger and have already been harvested is to grow the forest longer to you know essentially provide the ecological raw materials um, in the stand or in the ecosystem. And, uh, and so that uh, <clears throat> sent me on to just it, um, extended conversations about extended rotations with, um, with foresters and with economists, both at DNR and, um, and in private industry. And I um, have been struck over the years by uh, kind of the, the the pushback or the worry or um, the the re resistance to the idea and uh, um, you know one just a, a couple of vignettes about that and you know this is all about like what what has led us to actually you know engaging with a modeler and and um, and getting this exercise going but I remember having conversation with uh, and many of you might know Angus Brody uh, from DNR. And uh, at the time I was working at Department of Fish and Wildlife um, and he was working at DNR as a, um, you know, as kind of a <clears throat> technical person. 
on their sustainable harvest calculation. And this isn't the most, this isn't the one they're in right now. It's the one before. So that does age me, date me. Um, but he, he said they had looked at um, extending rotations and it did produce um, lots of volume, produce more volume than um, a 40 or 50 year rotation, uh, but it did not optimize uh, uh, revenue for the trust beneficiaries. So it was, um, you know, they had their limitations in being able to pursue that kind of um, that kind of approach. And then a more recent conversation with a, a friend of mine who works in private industry, we were having beers a couple of years ago and he's like, Bali, you just got to stop talking about this. It just scares the crap out of the industry. And we just, we're not going to make progress on, you know, joint conversations on, you know, all sorts of topics. If you just keep bringing this up and I had been bringing it up and bringing it up in the legislature, I've been bringing it up in lots of public meetings. And uh, it, it, again, I was like really struck by, by someone from industry telling me that I actually should not talk about this anymore. Um, and so, of course, I love a challenge, and uh, the um, stars finally aligned to be able to, um, uh, you know, hi find someone who was able to do this kind of optimization modeling and find the funding to be able to do it. So, I hope with that uh, with that context, then we will um, kick it over to Sean to talk about um, how he put the model together. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Paula and Rachel. Um, yeah, so I'm just I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk um, for a little bit here about the modeling approach that we took and and the methods. Um, Paula and Rachel will follow up again later with with uh, the results. And just as a, in the big picture here, what I what I created here was really a framework for Paula to um, play with different scenarios. Um, so I. Uh, didn't, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't the one to, um, to do that part of it. I just put together a whole basis uh, for Paula to be able to explore her ideas and kind of come to um, the different, different scenarios that she wanted to see. So the approach, as, as Paula mentioned here, was an optimization approach. We kind of took um, a linear programming uh, method that it, which is basically um we, you know we selected because it's it's really a commonly used method in, in industry and in agency management uh washington dnr uses a similar kind of approach to determine their sustainable harvest levels or a uh, blm in oregon does um you know in various industry groups do too so it's it's kind of a familiar and um uh, kind of accepted way to look at um, harvest levels over time uh, for forest management. And to support that linear program, basically what we need is to know what is out there on, on the landscape in terms of you know, the forest resource right now, its condition, um, how it's gonna grow over time so we can look at a kind of long time horizon and understand uh, you know, what's, what are the optimal management scenarios over that horizon. Um, so that requires sort of growth and yield. And then as you can see, they, I, I put together a user interface here for it, which was kind of where Paula connected with the model and got to play around with parameters. Um, so I'm gonna talk about each of these steps. Basically, if you know, I'll, I'll get into the details more, but if you're familiar with some of these uh, tools and abbreviations, we used FIA data for the basic inventory, um, stratified it by forest type ownership site index. Um, each of those strata got um, growth curves and yield yield tables uh, that was all done in, in FBS. Um, and then that was put into a linear program where uh, Paula was able to play around with parameters like the rotation age over time, setting a curve that changed over time throughout this, the, the, the model time period, a maximum harvest age, um, what ownership we were looking at, and things like that. Um, so the, the inventory basis for this, you know, this is, is really an important part of the model because it's, it's kind of uh, the snapshot we have of the land from time right now, and that tells us a lot about what we can do over uh, the next decades. Um, FIA, the U.S. Forest Service, you know, sample of forest lands across the, the whole U.S. Is a, is a pretty good data source for this. Um, it's good because it's an unbiased sample, so you can actually, you know, just use 
um, distribution and average values of the plots to rep uh, fairly represent the whole landscape and it covers all land ownerships, all forests. Um, um, it, the, the plots are kind of laid out like like this diagram, they're um, this little cluster and they're they're placed um, throughout on a, I don't remember the, the grid size, but they're placed throughout uh, the country. And this provided the, the basic data that, that we, we worked from for um, current and starting conditions, as well as the uh, inputs for the growth and yield modeling. Um, we focused on Western Washington. So this way we took all the FIA plots west of the, the Cascade Crest. Um, the FIA data, due to privacy reasons, because it does include private landowner forest inventory, um, the plot locations are not publicly available, they're fuzzed. So um, if we knew the exact plot locations, it would have been a little easier to choose the plots of interest, but um, instead we filtered based on the data in the table that FIA provides. So um, there's a lot of attributes associated with each plot. Um, for example, uh, FIA plots are, um, oh, and thanks, I see there's a comment that it's a 10 square mile grid. And I think that's, that, that sounds right. And it's a denser grid on forest service lands than elsewhere. Um, so ownership, um, we pulled state and private land ownerships. We did not look at federal lands or others. Uh, because of privacy reasons, again, the publicly available FIA data is categorized into pretty broad bins. So state includes state trust lands as well as Actually, state park, well, definitely state parks and other land ownerships. Um, in Western Washington, is pretty much DNR land and state parks. There's not a lot of state wildlife areas in the, on the west side, at least not of any much size. Um, and then private lands also, again, they lump together small, large, residential, industrial, and tribal all into one category. And that's just a limitation of, of the publicly available data set. There's not really much we can do about that. So a bit of a caveat, and there's a few caveats with the FIA data here, but it's it's really the best we, we have available. Um, for forest type, we focused on Doug fir and Western Hemlock Forest. This is the cover type call is similar to an SAF cover type if you're familiar with that. So it's based on, you know, the, the current species composition. Um, that, we, we focused in on just those two forest types out of the, the there were several more that are actually represented because they're the, there's about 65% of this land base and they're the focus of commercial management. And it was kind of important in our model to simplify a lot of things to focus it down so that we could um, keep the model tractable, have it be, you know, the, the more uh, strata that are introduced, the harder it is to get it to actually run without running out of memory or taking weeks to run or anything like that. And then there is a reserve status code, um, which I uh, effectively does filter out the state parks out of the state lands. Um, so, it, but it doesn't, it's not, um, it's not maybe as fine grained as we would like it to be. Uh, it doesn't necessarily include lands that are off the table for more administrative reasons or temporary decisions. It's really things that are very, you know, at a, a statutory level off the table, like, like state park lands. Um, and that's just, again, uh, kind of shortcoming we have to live with here, knowing that um, we're, we're representing, a, you know, some lands that aren't going to be harvested in this, and that's uh, uh, why perhaps in the future it'd be good to repeat this with, with some uh, agency data or something like that. Um, to continue the stratification, we cut up the plots into bins using um, site index, and that, you know, the FIA data set has site tree measurements. And so this is uh, just a representation of the site growth potential um, where, you know, site one is a, is a more, most productive site, site five is the least productive site. And um, that corresponds well to volume growth per year, height growth, things like that. And we cut up uh, stand ages into five-year bins and we did the analysis on a five-year time step. So this is just a visualization of that stratification. And I'm sorry, it's a little bit of an ugly graphic, but I just wanted to show, this is kind of all the bins that this was cut up into. So you can see across the horizontal here, you have five different site classes. It was cut up to state and private. Um, on these graphs, you have each bar represents an age class, a five-year age class. 
And the dark gray is Douglas fir plots. The light gray is Western hemlock plots. And so this is, this is basically the snapshot of how many plots. So the bar is taller when there's more plots of how many plots are in each um, of these strata buckets to start with. And, and the N here shows you the, the total number of plots. So there's some strata like state lands with, on low site, site five ground, where we only have 12 plots total. It's not very many. Um, in comparison, private land on site two, you know, pretty good site ground is we have 478 plots. I think the total was 1600 something or 1960 or something like that. Um, so that's the, the stratification. Um, to grow these plots over time, we, we basically in, enforced a pretty generic silvicultural regime. Um, the plots were grown out when the Curtis relative density, which is just a, a measure of, of stand stocking and density, when it re reached a value of 65, we cut back to a residual value of 30. And if you look at this graph on the right, that's kind of basically keeping it, you know, once it so it gets up near or into this self thinning zone where the density is high enough that the trees are starting to um, compete pretty intensely and uh, mortality will occur. Then at that point, it gets thinned down to this low competition zone and the trees that are left behind are free to grow. So it's a bit of a wider range than maybe some thinning regimes. You know, we let it go longer and take it down farther, but it's, it's not, it's, it's relatively typical. Um, and then at the rotation age, whatever um, the rotation age was set for at the, for, you know, certain uh, uh, simulation, the, the stand is clear cut with six trees per acre retention. Um, and then there was another rule that, you know, commercial thinning couldn't happen too close to that planned final harvest. Uh, the tree selection was, was pretty much just random across the diameter distribution. And after uh, clear cut, it was replanted on a 10 foot spacing with assumed 85% survival. Um, so all of the plots were subjected to this um, silvicultural regime and simulated a bunch of times with different rotation ages. So that, that age they would be clear cut at was set and they were simulated. Each plot was simulated over and over and each simulation was um, was uh, two, two rotations of the stand. So the current condition is, you know, the FIA measurement. We would grow it out to the rotation age, cut it, replant it, and then grow it out again and cut it. And so that's two entries. Um, the first cut is from the grown out plot data. The second cut is from the grown out simulated plantation, but that retains the six tree per acre signature of the original plot data. So it, it is not, it's not completely artificial. And, and we did that to kind of get a little bit more scope and more balance on the um, age class distribution and thinning because um, using just the current data, we would, have, we would have kind of skewed the representation we had of age classes and when they got harvested. So this is kind of what that looked like. We did every, we, we harvested, simulated harvesting stands at rotation ages ranging from 35 to 120 years old. And um, as I said, there were two entries. And so every combination of those two entries was simulated. For example, you know, if, uh, if the stand started at age 55, we simulate first, cut at 55, regenerate, cut at 35 and yada yada, as you see down this list. Um, it ends up being three, up to 324 permutations per FIA plot and, um, you know, some 360,000, I think, total uh, runs of FBS. Um, from each of the scenarios, we tracked yields um, in terms of net volume removed, uh, wood product carbon removed. And that is, is really just in wood products. There's other kind of pools that could be tracked, like what goes to the landfill and what's used for uh, you know, biofuel. And, and we, we really just focused on wood products for the removal and then the forest carbon retained, um, which is a combination of above and, and below ground. So we're really here, it, it's a limited scope of, 
uh, looking at carbon, it's the carbon in, in the forest and the carbon in wood products. Um, and there are other carbon pools, but they're pretty minor compared to these two and also a lot harder to track. So this was the focus. Um, the yield curves then ended up, this is uh, the example on the right. Uh, we, we ended up creating these curves for each site class separated by state and private. So each of those, each of those strata, this one you see is, is um, volume. Uh, so the lower sites produce less volume. Um, the curves, you know, on really high productivity sites, they go up and down pretty quickly as, as decay sets in pretty early on. On sort of more moderate sites, the, the volume sort of plateaus. So it kind of uh, appears reasonable. Um, and we, again, we created curves for volume, wood product carbon and forest carbon, Six, so 60 yield curves total. Um, so that's all the material that needs to be put into the linear program. We have the inventory, we have the yield curves, and the linear program then was set up to run for 70 years from 2025 to 2095 on five-year time steps. Um, the user, in this case, Paula, was able to select from uh, three different objective functions. Um, could choose to try for to have the linear program maximize the output of um, carbon over time, which is the sum of forest carbon and the wood product carbon. Um, and in this case, the wood product carbon was decayed over time. Uh, I'll show that in a second. Um, the second choice was to maximize present value uh, based on some user supplied economic parameters. It's pretty, pretty high level, you know, rough economic parameters or uh, but a pretty simple way of including it, which is nice for kind of keeping it transparent. Or the user could select to maximize volume output total over the time period. Um, for the wood decay, we used this um, 2019 article. And you can see the difference between the, this dashed line is the cumulative uh, inputs to the wood product pool. The solid line is the product pool itself. And so the difference there is is essentially the decay. Um, and that we, we follow the methods from that paper to uh, decay the wood over time. Um, the linear program is set up with the objective function on the one side, as I just mentioned, um, and on the other side, constraints about what the program can do. So the, the basic constraint is area control, which is a, the technical term in linear programming, but it basically just sets up the initial distribution of those strata. So the strata are ownership, site class, forest type, and how many acres are in each of those strata to begin with is based on the FIA sample. And that's really the value of the FIA sample here. A big one is that it's an unbiased sample. So we can use the distribution of plots in those strata in the FIA sample to directly convert to acreage across the study area. Um, area control also controls those minimum and maximum rotation age setting and handles kind of the, the guts of linear program, growing tree, uh, uh, aging the stands over time, resetting ages when it's harvested. There was also a constraint that could be set um, or, or not of um, a an, an, uh, final area weighted stand age. And this, this constraint kind of, if you, if you have to have an average age of at least say 50 years at the end of the period, it kind of keeps the linear program from just running away at the end of the simulation and, and harvesting everything because as far as it's concerned, the world is ending. Um, and then there was a harvest continuity constraint that was uh, in force two that could be set where um, period to period, so these are five-year periods, that in period to period variation could be limited to a certain uh, percentage. To, to supply, and that was variation in uh, volume removed. So again, I wrap this all up in a user interface with the web app for Paula to use. Um, this is just a little clip of it. You can set, you know, in this case, the rotation age at the beginning and end of the of the um, the window and how long, you know, it took to transition from the beginning to ending rotation age and all the other parameters I mentioned could be set as well. And I'll hand it off to Paula. All right, thank you for that. Um, so yeah, as uh, Sean described, he built this great car um, and Rachel and I uh, 
<clears throat> interacted with him on the specifications for building the car. And then uh, we drove it around quite a bit uh, and would come back to him and say, hmm, it's not quite performing as we think it, uh, we think it should. And so there were actually, um, <clears throat> I think four iterations of this uh, model that Sean uh, uh, you know, built and, and tinkered with for us um, you know, over a several month period. Um, so I just wanted to, um, you know, really um, kudos to him for all of the work that went into um, producing something that could be useful. So then uh, with all of those, um, with that user interface, I could then fiddle with all of the parameters and, and look for um, different patterns in uh, both forest carbon uh, stocking over time, in change in age class distribution over the landscape, and in um, uh, in output of uh, uh, timber volume. And so, uh, you know, there's there's <clears throat> really a, a pretty large number of scenarios that, that one could run, um, but what we were looking for um, is was a, a, a combination of outputs or, or patterns that met these multiple policy goals. And so the first one was increased forest carbon stocking. Um, and, you know, obviously that's, that's for um, climate mitigation. Um, and it's also for resilience. There's, and we don't have time to go into this, but there is research to suggest that that stands that have higher carbon stocking values are more resilient to drought and to um, fire and to insects and um, and and maintain um, higher levels of biodiversity, which is important for long-term adaptation in the face of climate change. Um, so within that, we're also looking for um, uh, a, a steady increase or um, maintenance of carbon stocking after it went up rather than it going up and coming back down and going back up because anytime your carbon stocking um, goes down in the forest, you're, um, you're emitting CO2 and we wanted to not have that happen uh, during the course of the uh, 70 year sim <clears throat> simulation period. And then uh, as Sean mentioned, um, you can uh, you know put a, um, a desired end um, age uh, for your area weighted um, uh, average stand age uh, for the acres that you were modeling. And so, um, uh, so <clears throat> again, we were looking for increased forest age in order to create the, um, you know, the, the ability for these stands to be managed for um, uh, critters that needed, uh, that need big trees and large snags and down wood. Um, but, you know, there's also, um, the science that re really suggests, and this is across forest types ac across the globe, that most of the carbon in the forest is um, stored in larger trees. And you don't get larger trees unless you have older um, uh, average sand ages at the end. Um, and I'll talk about what parameters I put in to kind of get to these scenarios, but this is what we were looking for. And then it was really important, Rachel mentioned this in the beginning, um, that we wanted uh, to, uh, see if there were scenarios that had a minimal disruption to wood supply. And when we were entering into this, um, I think we had the, um, uh, the assumption that in order to get to, you know, take a landscape from a 40 year rotation to an 80 year rotation, there would be some period in, when they, in which there was gonna be a dip in um, wood supply. And we were, we were hoping to be able to find scenarios that had as low a dip as possible. And then we, we would spend, based on that, we would spend a lot of time trying to think about, well, you know, what does that mean for mills? You know, would there be interventions that would needed to keep mills open and not lose them? Because we know how important that is to, um, you know, being able to keep um, that really important infrastructure around. Um, and, you know, and just for um, support from uh, the the communities, from the industry itself, from um, folks that live in communities that work um, in the woods and in mills. So, so minimizing that disruption was um, super, super important to um, our intent for doing this um, exercise. So that was a um, a big driver of the scenario construction, and then also relatively even flow of timber. Um, and again, just based on. Um, what, you know, what we've heard over the years um, interacting with, uh, you know, uh, for instance, trust beneficiaries for DNR and, um, and uh, again, representatives of the industry having predictable um, uh, flow of timber volume is important to, um, to their business model. Uh, 
Um, and then Sean already talked about the fact that there were, you know, three different overriding optimization drivers. And so you could either maximize for carbon or harvest volume or net present value. And um, we did a lot of exploration of what uh, what the different outcomes were based on, um, you know, doing one set of the the other parameters and then maximizing on these three different uh, uh, these three different outcomes. So um, let's see, that's a little bit out of order. I started. Um, sorry about that. But so he, here's the the um, the parameters that I could play with as at the user interface. And so one was the starting and ending rotation age. Um, and uh, and so for this um, search of an optimal scenario, um, we chose uh, a starting rotation of 40 and ending rotation of 80. Then you could do time to transition to the end of the rotation age. Um, and uh, 40 years seemed to be a good transition. You could do it shorter, um, uh, but that you know created some other issues. So 40 seemed to work well with a, a lot of experimentation. And then this uh, age limits on harvest on, at the start and end of the modeling period. Uh, so as Sean mentioned, we couldn't uh, we couldn't limit the or or select the plots based on where they were um, geographically relative to uh, constraints that that landowners might have. And so DNR, for instance, has a habitat conservation plan, and there's places where they can't harvest for, um, they can't harvest occupied murelet habitat, and there's areas that they're going to be growing murelet habitat. They um, have limited harvestability in uh, riparian zones, and then um, there is some uh, uh, harvest potential within areas for spotted owl habitat, and, and those areas are on long rotations. So, um, and then there's, there's also for um, any of the um, activists that might be listening to this talk, um, you know, there's a lot of concern about uh, harvesting the sort of remaining patches of older structurally complex forests that aren't protected by the HCP, um, both for local biodiversity concerns and for the um, carbon emissions um, implications. And so I tried to simulate um, protecting those stands in addition to um, not having the model just go harvest all the um, old growth that's that's uh, you know off limits by policy and all the spotted owl and murelet um, habitat that's off base by their HCP. So um, we really and, and I know this isn't perfect, uh, but the the way we tried to get at it was um, including a um, a beginning harvest limit so the model wouldn't harvest anything over eighty years. And by the end of the model. Um, we let it go to the maximum it was going to harvest anyway, which was 120, because the average stand age was um, was increasing over time. Uh, and then minimum age at the um, at the end of the modeling period, um, I chose 80, 75 or 80 for that. And again, that was to try to um, you know get the model to simulate the conditions we were really looking for, and having those older, having that average um, stand age that was um, more in in the in the 80 range. Um, rather than something like uh, like 50 or 60. And then that, again, kept the model from um, cutting a bunch of older forests towards the end of the modeling periods. And then this uh, variability of harvest levels between five years, that turned out to be a really important parameter. Um, and when, when uh, we let the model run at 10% um, variability or 20% variability, which is a little more common in, um, in sustainable harvest calculation models, uh, it really, um, the model really ran wild. And so one, there was, um, there was a lot of variation over, over time. And so it wasn't that nice, even flow. And it also ended, um, ended up harvesting, um, more, uh, more wood towards the end of the model. And we ended up getting even, even within the constraints of an 80 year rotation, you ended up getting lower forest carbon, um, towards the end than not, <clears throat> than not compared to the beginning, but um, compared to the middle parts of the model. And, and again, we were looking for scenarios that did not end up, um, you know, releasing more CO2 into the atmosphere towards the end because of in, an intensification of harvest. And then uh, minimum age at thinning uh, was, um, uh, was 25. All right, moving along. So, this uh, this slide represents the output um, on wood products carbon and forest carbon, um, and this is a scenario that we ran on 700,000 acres of west side uh, DNR lands. 
and um, chose 700,000 acres because the other um, 600, a little bit more thousand acres are um, mostly, not completely, but uh, mostly off limits to harvest, definitely off limits to clear cut harvest because of their obligations under the Endangered Species Act with their um, habitat conservation plan and some of their you know, additional old growth protection policies. So again, that was uh, in addition to the age limit, um, this was a way to try to get at uh, uh, simulating harvest on the um, the number of acres in which uh, DNR has the ability to actively manage. So, so this is a pretty cool output. Um, the uh, uh, the top part of the the graph, the top color piece of it, is um, gain in uh, forest carbon uh, translated to uh, carbon dioxide equivalents over time. Um, and that represents a, a gain of about 32 million tons of CO2 over that 70 year period. And then the bottom part is a gain in um, wood products carbon taking into account decay over that 70 year period. Um, and that ended up being a little over 28 million um, metric tons of CO2 over that 70 year period. So really cool output, but then what happens to, um, to timber uh, volume over time under this scenario? Um, so the top of the bar is total, um, uh, total harvest in, uh, uh, fractions of a billion board feet every year. Um, and, you know, each, uh, each number underneath represents a five-year period. So it's, it's, you know, annual harvest averaged over a five-year period. And so, um, and, you know, another parameter that you could input into the model was starting volume over the landscape. And so I put in what uh, DNR's current sustainable harvest calculation, um, you know, averages for the decade that we're in right now, which is about 450 million board feet a year. And, um, and so at least what this model was able to produce was a slowly increasing um, harvest volume available and, and cut, you know, over time, over the 70 year period. So, um, <clears throat> and this, this pattern was really created by tamping down on the um, ability of the, the model to, to vary harvest um, over time, um, the, the smoothness of the pattern anyway. But what it reflects, um, at least according to the plot data, is a biological capacity to um, slowly increase harvest, um, <clears throat> but do so in a way that um, retains more carbon in the forest, which was really cool. I honestly did not expect this. Um, like, like, like I said before, I expected there at least to be um, a moderate dip in volume. Um, so this is this is a pleasant surprise. Um, and then you'll also notice the different color bars. The lighter um, lighter color is from thinning, and the darker color is from clear cut harvest. And so for the first several decades, up really through the middle of the um, the modeling period, most of the volume is coming from thinning, and. Uh, um, I won't go into why we think it's actually realistic based on what the model did right now. I mean, we can talk about that in question and answer because I um, I'm worried I'm going over a little bit over time. Um, but anyway, it's a cool pattern. More carbon in the forest, um, increased uh, uh, carbon in the wood products pool. Although we do have to note that um, if we modeled it beyond seven years, that uh, that um, increase would um, level off and and slowly <clears throat> slowly decline over time, um, but then there's no, at least according to um, these initial results and with all the limitations that Sean talked about, um, there uh, might not be any need to, uh, you know, to, to, to worry about um, declines in, uh, in, in volume going to mills. Um, and then <clears throat> with the idea, and Rachel will talk about this more, the idea of there needing to be more thinning um, implies that we would need to uh, uh, employ more people. So that would be uh, not a bad outcome either. Let's see. And then um, just wanted to compare um, and show that if we ran the maximum carbon scenario, you got like way more carbon in the forest, uh, slow increase in, in uh, carbon and wood products, but um, a decline in uh, wood volume uh, being produced over time. And so again, that does not admit, that doesn't fit our um, uh, our hoped for policy outcomes. So we did not consider this to be a um, an optimum scenario. And then uh, <clears throat> and then this is a um, comparison and it has to be in a slightly different form just because of the way the the graphing worked. but this is what happens um, under a 40 year rotation on the same land land base. Um, 
that 700,000 acre of DNR land. So the dark line above is a, um, the increase in uh, uh, carbon dioxide equivalents in wood products. And then the lower line is what happens to carbon in the forest. So, so if DNR is not on a total um, uh, 40 year rotation now, but if they were to switch to that over time, you would get a decrease in, um, uh, in forest carbon, which again is uh, not optimal. All right, I'm going to go through here. Um, and then just uh, quickly showing you get a similar pattern if we run the same, the optimum scenario parameters on um, private lands and you get somewhat more gains in um, uh, both forest carbon and carbon and wood products because they're starting from a lower, um, a lower level of carbon stocking and younger stand age. Um, and these lands are um, uh, somewhat more productive. All right, take home lessons. Um, looks like, and uh, you know, again, I just wanna emphasize that we understand that this is a, a model and that we're just ex exploring these potentials, but um, you know, these patterns suggest that we could make this transition without leakage, um, which essentially means, you know, shifting emissions um, uh, from har to harvest elsewhere. Um, we can uh, get more carbon stored in the forest. Um, there's the potential to increase ecosystem complexity depending on the way that uh, thinning is um, executed on the ground in reality. Um, again, more thinning, way more thinning. Um, and then the, that need for more thinning implies potential for higher employment. And now I will pass it over to Rachel. Thanks so much, Paula. So um, you can consider Sean the methods section, Paula the results, and me the discussion. There's a lot to discuss, so I'm going to go fairly quickly. Sorry about that in advance. Um, so as Paula described, our model showed an opportunity for multiple benefits, which requires more thinning. So my role is to dig into some of the practical considerations of making that change at the forest level. And before I dive in, I'll borrow a quote from a presenter yesterday, which is, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So at the, the risk of sounding like a broken record, um, there's many assumptions built into our model. Some of those may be challenging to achieve on the ground, but the model is intended to just give us some directional information and an avenue to explore and to iterate on. So here's how I'd characterize the opportunity to shift to a model of extended rotations with more thinning to sequester more carbon, achieve stable or greater timber harvest volume, keep sawmills running, maintain or grow employment and produce higher quality wood. But we acknowledge that doing so would require adaptation across the supply chain for landowners and forest managers to do more thinning, for mills to process larger diameter logs. I saw a question about this in the Q&A. Uh, for investors and companies to um, rethink the, the way they consider expectations on rates of return and discount rates. As a quick refresher, a discount rate is the amount by which companies devalue future income compared to today's income. So the discount rate is used to calculate net present value or the value of a future timber sale in today's dollars. So companies seeking to compete with investments in other sectors may use a discount rate that's comparable to a return on investment in those sectors. But those calculations don't always capture the public value of forests like carbon sequestration, wildlife, water, et cetera. And so recognizing that value requires public entities and markets to send signals and compensate and incentivize for that ecological value. So to shift to the stand level and talk about what extended rotations and thinning would look like, um, I've got a figure here uh, from our friends at Northwest Natural Resources Group, which models carbon dynamics in a specific stand in Washington. And I don't wanna fixate on all of the specific details of this figure uh, because there's some differences between this scenario and our model but I'm sharing it to talk about what an 80 year harvest schedule could look like at the stand level. So this figure shows two 80 year rotations. Those are the two um, kind of peaks you're seeing. And in green is uh, carbon at a stand level. Uh, blue is carbon stored in durable wood products and red um, is in the landfill. Um, and then I've, I've added some uh, bars, black bars to show uh, where there's commercial thinning and gold bars for final harvest. Um, so just to talk about what the sort of uh, management over an 80 year rotation could look like, you've got your pre-commercial thin, um, which is focused on uh, stand health and retaining healthiest trees rather than generating uh, merchantable timber. And then you've got um, commercial thin or thins. Um, you could thin a productive stand at 30 to 35 years and every 10 or 20 years thereafter, depending on the site index or the quality of the site and your goals as a landowner. 
And there's many different approaches to thinning silviculturally, which I'll talk about in a minute. And I'll share some data on thinning in our own model. And then there's the final harvest. Um, for simplicity's sake, the final harvest in our model is a clear cut. But because rotations are longer, there's less clear cutting. And that has significant benefits in terms of soil carbon, habitat, and um, less herbicide use in stand reestablishment. So to, to drill in on that piece, um, the decrease in clear cutting, if we take the example of state lands, um, under DNR's West Side Harvest Plan, um, there's about 11,000 acres of clear cutting each year. Um, our model uh, output reduces clear cutting to about 3,000 acres per year in the initial years as those uh, younger stands are grown into older stands across the landscape. And then gradually uh, the clear cutting increases to a little over 6,000 acres per year by the end of that 70 year simulation. So they're still clear cutting, but it is significantly less. Instead of a clear cut, landowners could experiment with variable retention harvest, where they're removing um, most, but not all of the dominant trees. So I wanna emphasize that landowners are already doing uh, this sort of management with extended rotations and um, more thinning. Um, small forest landowners, tribal nations, and community forests like the Nisqually Community Forest are doing this sort of management. We'll hear from the Nisqually Community Forest, in fact, um, in the next panel uh, on community forests. Uh, and that's an example of management with more entries, more commercial thinning, uh, and that's not done at a loss. So in addition to timber harvest, the Nisqually Community Forest has explicit goals of supporting salmon, recreation, and as much local employment as possible. So they're running a viable forestry operation and they're doing so in a way that generates and enhances other benefits. So um, here's the thinning output from our model. It's a bit of a complex figure. Um, what we're seeing is the final harvest age on your x-axis. Um, so at, at, at what age is the stand harvested? And then you're seeing on the y-axis uh, the range of ages at which thinning occurs. And you can see the different greens distinguish uh, how many times the stand is thinned. So in our model, the number of commercial thins varies between one and three. Um, to be specific, 59% of the stands were thinned once, 32 were thinned twice, and 9% were thinned three times. Uh, as Sean described, our, our model waits for a fairly high relative density before doing a fairly aggressive thin, but you could adjust those parameters in a variety of ways. Um, and one of the reasons that some of these stands are thin fewer times is because they're being transitioned into a longer rotation. Once they get there, um, you generally have a uh, higher frequency of thinning. And of course, this all depends on, on your site quality as well. We can talk about this more in Q&A if folks want. Just to give a sense of um, what thinning could look like, different options for thinning, um, our model thins randomly across all diameter classes, but in practice, you could play with the frequency, the intensity, the spatial distribution, according to your landowner goals and your desired future conditions. So on the left, we've got an example of uh, thin from below, where you're taking smaller diameter trees to allow your uh, largest, most healthy, robust trees to thrive and grow more. On the right, we have an example of variable density thinning, where you're creating skips and gaps, um, creating complexity in the landscape that has lots of positive impacts for forest health, resistance and disturbance, biodiversity, natural regeneration. Uh, I want to acknowledge too that there's other site-specific constraints that forest managers would need to contend with related to slope, yarding corridors. With more thinning, you have to be more intentional that you're, you're felling, you're yarding, you're skidding, or minimizing damage to remaining trees. Okay, so to pivot to economic considerations, um, there's a few different uh, ways that this sort of forestry would shift your economics. So investment is a big one. Um, you can clear cut more quickly and more cheaply. Thinning requires nearly twice the operational costs of clear cutting. And because thinning adds more entries, it also requires greater mobilization costs to get your equipment to the site. So thinning is a greater investment per a given volume of harvested wood. That's the bad news. The good news is that as the stand ages and you continue to thin, you're harvesting a greater volume and you're building more value in the standing trees on your land. So increasing thinning and extending rotations increases both the volume and the value of wood, uh, which in some cases may offset those additional operational costs at the stand level. Another consideration is cash flow. Um, in comparison to short rotation conventional forestry where you're getting most of your revenue and payoff uh, at the final harvest at the end, 
doing thinning throughout the life of the stand helps to generate um, more frequent regular revenue, which can be beneficial for landowners. And then lastly, um, the products you're producing, the logs you're producing will be on kind of both ends of the side spectrum. So you'll have smaller logs resulting from thinning. Um, luckily, there's a lot of innovation happening around using smaller logs for products like cross laminated timber. And that's driven in part by wildfire risk reduction and forest health work. On the other side of the spectrum, you'll get older, larger diameter timber when you're doing your final harvest of you know, 80 plus year old trees. Um, and that timber is of higher value, uh, including in the export market. So producing that higher quality or appearance grade wood can again offset some of the costs, operational costs of thinning. Uh, mills previously paid a premium for larger logs and there would be a need for, in some cases, mills to retool or reconfigure to process those larger logs again. Uh, of course, uh, employment and capacity is an important part of this puzzle too. Longer rotations represent both an opportunity and a challenge for lo local employment. Uh, I created this graph on the right from Bureau of Labor Statistics data showing employment in the forest sector in Washington over the last, I guess that's 65 years. Um, and what we can see is a, is a decrease in employment you know, as mechanization in the timber sector um, and conventional short rotation forestry produce uh, fewer jobs than they used to. So one challenge of doing extended rotations and more thinning would be um, developing the workforce that can do that work. It's increasingly challenging to find contractors who are proficient at thinning. And so um, there's a need for greater capacity in layout and administration and many, many aspects. So there's an opportunity here to build capacity to do this work and support um, a kind of a transition to an ecological forest economy uh, in rural communities. So investing in a transition is a, an important topic we can talk about more uh, in the Q&A. It's important to note that our models show no decrease in timber volume, which is good for mills, and minimal decrease in net present value, which is good for landowners and investors. But nonetheless, we recognize there's likely a need to invest in making shifts across the supply chain and across the landscape at this scale. So I'm not gonna read these to you uh, in uh, this list, but these are all different financial tools that we could use in, in different combinations, in different circumstances to recognize the additional, additional benefits produced by extended rotations and to incentivize landowners to take them up. So my big picture summary is if there are three kind of categories of constraints for us to overcome, uh, one is awareness of the potential gains of extended rotations in, in terms of economics um, and ecological impact and a willingness to innovate. We're trying to prompt some of that discussion with this model. Uh, second is forest manager and operator capacity to actually do this uh, slightly different kind of forestry at a larger scale. Uh, and third is public and private finance to support landowners and mills in making that transition. So just real quick, next steps for this project. We hope to discuss uh, these results in the model with um, a range of stakeholders and land managers. I mentioned some of them there, but um, we'd love to continue this conversation with any of you um, moving forward. And then we'd love to refine the model based on what we learn about operational constraints and ideally, uh, as Sean mentioned, using um, better inventory data. So thanks very much uh, to the many folks who have discussed this idea with us uh, along the way, um, and we'll be happy to take your questions. Wonderful, thank, thank you, Rachel, and thank you to our panelists for that extremely detailed uh, presentation and the really interesting results and conclusions that uh, came out from this analysis. I'm sure that there is a lot of, um, details and we can spend a lot of time talking about the actual analysis. Um, I would encourage folks to send clarifying questions into um, the, the chat room and we will try and answer some of those questions that are just clarifying uh, using the chat function. Um, and perhaps now, uh, maybe just to jump right into the thorniest of, of issues um, with a question from Martha Wheeling. Um, and perhaps addressing this one to you, Paula, um, and others, feel free to, to jump in. The question is, you know, a management approach here that would uh, result in um, average ages over 75 years, uh, particularly on DNR lands. And some in interest groups strongly believe that state lands older than 75 years shouldn't be harvested. And so uh, is there a risk here that we're creating um, for by adopting an approach where if the state tries to harvest uh, trees that are grown to older rotations, that it is sued because they're too old to harvest. 
Um, so maybe Paula, this one starting off with you, sort of what policy level um, changes do we make, need to be making here? Um, and if you could respond to Martha, that would be great. Yeah, um, no, I appreciate the question, Martha. And we've uh, gotten that. Uh, Rachel and I gave a presentation to Washington Association of Counties uh, about a year ago or so, and we we got a very similar question to that. And so, you know, the um, I think what's driving a lot of the energy around um, conserving these forests that are 75 or 80 years older right now um, comes from their uh, relative rareness or uniqueness on the landscape. And uh, um, I. Uh, address this in, I, I think, the, the Q&A to someone who asked the question about what the starting um, starting average uh, age was. And, and at least, um, you know, based on the data that we had, um, you know, average age on DNR lands was 48 at the beginning of our simulation and, and you know, 80, 80 towards the end. Um, and so the, the rareness um, of some of these stands that, uh, you know, maybe were regenerated from fire or um, were Kind of harvested in a in a messy way that left some big legacy trees at the end, and then creates um, some plant biodiversity that is um, that is right now rare on the landscape. Like that's that's what activists are focusing on, um, and so I think if we uh, have a situation 50, 60, 70 years from now where um, eighty year stands are common and they're grown up from uh, essentially from prior plantations. Um, I, I think that the con that concern is um, is going to um, not be as high. And then you know there is there is a, a carbon concern as well with harvesting harvesting some of these stands now. But I think you know what what we show here is that once you get to that um, average um, older age class, you are storing more carbon in the forest, and so it's not um, uh, it, it you're you're not producing net emissions essentially when you're harvesting on that. Um, on that type of scenario, so that's you know that's a little that's a little bit more um, just context for why I think once you once the transition has been made, um, we're not going to have the same issues that you're hearing now. Uh, it doesn't you know I could be wrong, right? I mean you we, we, you could you could have the scenario that you're describing where um, under no circumstance any stand in in that age class wouldn't um, would be objected to from a harvest perspective, and. You know, and maybe there's maybe there is something that's you know written into DNR policy or written into um, legislation about um, the kinds of stands and their um, characteristics for sort of protecting from harvest um, altogether now versus um, you know making sure and allowing that these managed stands that get to be older over time you know remain remain available to harvest. So I, I think that that's a um, you know that's a fine thing to. Um, that's a fine thing to contemplate. And I'll stop there and let others jump in. Rachel, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, sure. And uh, sorry in advance, I'm trying to avoid a sunbeam at my desk. Um, so I'm bobbing around. So yes, I mean, th thanks Paula for that um, response. That's a lot of what's on my mind too. I guess I'll just reiterate, I don't see, um, you know, uh, conservation of kind of rare remnant forests of high conservation value as being in conflict with this uh, transition we're talking about of extending rotations across the landscape. I think we need to be judicious in what forests we're saying are irreplaceable, um, but we should be protecting those. And then I see this extended forestry, other climate smart forest management as being what we should be doing in sort of the rest of the, the matrix um, on the rest of the land base. And I think it can cause challenges if there is not a bigger picture understanding of say, uh, the plan for managing state lands for climate. Like if, if there were a broader understanding of how different tools would be deployed, I think that would help manage some of that tension. Um, but my feeling is we are coming to a place of more understanding um, on this topic across the kind of environmental um, spectrum. Uh, it's a question that we've gotten so much that actually we've created a little one pager at WBC about how those two strategies meld together. Um, and I wanna take this opportunity too to mention something I intended to say in my presentation about um, challenges for the Department of Natural Resources in particular. Um, there are kind of a set of specific constraints related to uh, the way trust lands are managed. One of them being that DNR receives 25 cents on the dollar um, to do management for any revenue generated. So doing a lot more thinning doesn't pencil out for DNR uh, kind of with the current structure. There need to be 
supplementary funds to sort of unlock that thinning and figure out how to bring these different pieces together of protecting unique older forests and extending rotations. Thank you, Rachel. Um, there are many other questions in the chat about um, NPV maximization strategies that were adopted in the in the, in this analysis. And so maybe if you could just clarify, uh, Paula, some of the thinking around uh, the choice of discount rates, um, you know, three percent on DNR land and three percent on on private land um, landowners. As you know, discount rates of private landowners are typically higher. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about sort of what you what the other scenarios you ran um, might have done as you tried different sort of MPV optimization strategies? Yeah, sure. It's a great question. So the three percent on DNR land is what they use in their in their sustainable harvest calculation right now. So that um, uh, that just match that and uh, and then also just um, an understanding of what you know. As Rachel said, a discount rate essentially means what how you value the future, and you know the intent behind this modeling exercise was was really to um, set things up so people living in the future um, have a better chance, um, uh, you know, quite bluntly at at surviving what's coming at us from climate change. And this is just like one area of of contribution. And so so there's a there's an ethical piece of uh, selecting a lower discount rate. Um, and then uh, on the private land scenario, um, I did play with uh, uh, somewhat higher discount rates. And it in in this optimal scenario where I really limited the um, the variability year to year, um, the discount rate like up to five or six percent didn't uh, it didn't alter the harvest pattern. It does harv it it does alter um, the calculation of. Um, you know, of actual net present value, you know, income. Um, and so the higher the discount rate, you know, the the lower your income is um, in, in further out years because you're just discounting the value of that money um, further mm -hmm. out. Um, but if you get up into like a 10% discount rate, then that drives um, a higher level of harvest. And so you've got more timber volume and less carbon in the forest if you went up to like a 10 or 12 or 15% discount rate. And so, you know, we did try that just to see, you know, how does discount rate affect the behavior of the model? And so um, moderately, like moderate increases from that 3% um, didn't change things at low harvest variability, um, but high, high discount rates did. So I, I hope that answers the question. Great, thank you. Um, one of the one of the obvious impacts of sort of moving from you know the current sort of harvest regime to one that combines um, really largely relies on thinning, but um, um, other harvest approaches as well is is the need to, as you noted in your in your comments, Rachel, um, compensate landowners appropriately to create the right incentives. Um, do you see opportunities for Washington's new Climate Commitment Act to support this transition? And what other policy levers do we have? Or do you, do you think needs to be a part of this conversation? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, and as I think I mentioned in my presentation, there's so many avenues to explore. You know, there's not going to be one silver bullet that solves the, the problem entirely, but we happen to be very lucky in Washington right now to be on the cusp of starting implementation of the Climate Commitment Act that will bring in revenue to a natural climate solutions fund that um, one of the eligible project types for those funds is specifically uh, projects that support additional carbon sequestration and also uh, resilience and, and various other types of, of related work. Um, so I think there is opportunity to dedicate some of those funds to precisely these sorts of transi transitions, whether it be efforts on private lands or state lands. I mean, right now we don't, it's not like there is a existing program um, that really fit neatly fits into this model. So I think we'll need to be creative about seeking sources of, of revenue from funds like that. Carbon offsets are also an option to contribute. Um, I'd love to hear your reflections on this question too, Amrita. Great, and pa Paula, over to you if you have any thoughts before respond um well just one thing i wanted to clarify uh is that i mean this is based on a question that i um that i saw in the chat is, is that we're not suggesting that you know private industry 
you know, adopt this wholesale because we understand that, you know, if you're a big timber company and you've got investors and you're, um, you, you know, the, the, <clears throat> the, the goal of your business is to maximize net present value um, or internal rate of return to your investors, that this is not likely something you're going to, you're going to do. Um, and it's not just for the, um, the, the, like the, the difference in cost. I mean, the conversations I've had with um, large timber companies over, you know, the last 10, 15 years is, um, you know, there's, there's risk issues as well in terms of like having that inventory out there for a longer period of time. Um, and just their, their whole business model isn't set up that way, but there are um, some, some larger private entities that are interested in managing forest for climate mitigation. And they're they're not necessarily um, timber owners right now, but are interested in becoming that, but they're concerned about, um, they're concerned about leakage. And so that was one of the um, goals of this modeling was to say, so if, if an entity was interested in purchasing private industrial timberlands when they come up for sale, um, you know, and they wanted to meet climate goals, like, you know, could, could they do it um, and not have a leakage issue, but also could they do it um, and be able to, you know, at least pay for their operations. And, and the, the answer looks, um, looks like it is, um, it is yes. So that's a sort of in, in addition, I mean, I really agree with Rachel that um, there's a lot of, there is a lot of potential with the natural climate solutions account to be able to, you know, for instance, uh, subsidize DNR's operations. So um, the, uh, the lower, the um, lower, you know, overall rate of return that you get because thinning is more expensive doesn't come out of the pockets of the beneficiaries. I mean, one policy idea, some of that money would come from the natural climate solutions account. So. Thank you. Um, and in the interest of time, perhaps maybe just one, um, one last quick question um, about the benefits here of this strategy um, outside of just carbon. So, you know, I think maybe what are the co-benefits of extending rotations beyond carbon sequestration? And in answering that question, um, you know, noting that the choice of thinning here may have a, may have certain trade-offs as opposed to using other subcultural approaches like variable retentions that you noted, Rachel, that might have different biodiversity impacts. So if you could just talk about those and, and encourage others to extend our time together over chat and, and emails if we haven't answered your question. And I guess, thanks for this question. Um, just really briefly, given the time we have, you know, I, I think there are benefits in an array of ecosystem services, um, but also I believe in kind of recreation value, cultural value, um, all those sorts of social values. We're hearing from people really strongly on state lands, a desire um, to be able to recreate and, and be in forests that are more complex, more mature. Um, and it's, it's true, as you mentioned, Amrita, that, it, you know, as you do more kind of variable retention harvest and you uh, do kind of more complex silviculture, there is the potential to enhance those benefits. And I think realistically, if a given landowner decides to pursue extended rotations, you know, they can and should think about what are the other values they're pursuing and adjust their, their model to match that. Um, but I'll just, if folks didn't watch it yesterday, I'll give a plug for um, Julia Jay's presentation on the connection between forest management and uh, water benefits, uh, which showed a whole array of benefits related to, you know, kind of gaps um, in forests as you're managing your forests and also um, older forests. Um, so I'll turn it over to Paul or Sean to anything else you might want to. No, from you, Sean, you haven't, you haven't had an opportunity to speak in the Q&A, but that's fine if you. Well, I've been busy typing, uh, <laughs> parallel, <laughs> parallel discussion. Oh, good, good. Okay, um, yeah, I mean, I just, I think, you know, I know I mentioned this in my, my uh, preamble that um, to me, the, the biodiversity benefits are really, really important and getting bigger trees back on the landscape is, um, is, is key to that. And there is, there's, there's a lot of research that shows um, both the benefits of that, but, uh, you know, kind of on a big picture scale, you know, the, um, <clears throat> UN conference on biodiversity is happening right now. And there is a recognition that loss of biodiversity in the face, uh, well, in, in the face of, of all sorts of human activities, uh, climate change included is as, as big a crisis and as big a threat to human survival. Um, and so making sure that we, 
uh, take that into account in our long-term force management decisions, I, I, I think is really important. So I'll end there. But before Thanks. we end, I want to um, give a quick plug to a panel that's happening later today on the Climate Smart Wood Group. And one aspect we didn't talk about a whole lot here is the increase in interest from architects, engineers, construction sector developers to source wood um, that does have carbon benefits and other benefits as well. Um, and extended rotation sort of fits into that model of thinking about climate smart forestry across the supply chain um, in the building sector. Great, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Rachel, Paula, and Sean. Um, and for the audience for attending this session, we now have a break for lunch and then the next session starts at 1 p.m. It's titled Keeping It Local, Perspectives from Community Forests in Washington. So I hope to see you all there and thank you once again. Thanks.